Nigerian president candidate Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, led a protest today to the headquarters of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, in Abuja. Reports indicate his supporters, dressed in black, marched to the INEC headquarters in protest against the just-concluded presidential election that saw the old Progressive Congress candidate Bola Tinubu declared winner. I reached out to Medina Dauda, our VOA Abuja Bureau coordinator, to brief us more on the matter. The presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar, and his vice presidential candidate, Ifaini Okowa, and also the chairman of the People's Democratic Party, Iyotia Ayu, led a whole team of people, multitudes of them, to the INEC headquarters here in Abuja, protesting the elections of the 25th of February, 2023. What they are demanding from INEC is to cancel the election completely. The chairman took a letter to INEC, which was received on behalf of the chairman, Mahmoud Yakubu, by the Commissioner of Voter Education, Sestos Okoye. In the letter, PDP is asking that the entire presidential elections be cancelled so that a fresh election can hold. That is what they demanded. Traffic was held up at the INEC headquarters. It was a whole lot of multitudes of people that went for this protest. You'll find old people, middle-aged people, and the youth that even outnumbered those elderly people. INEC did not promise anything, but they received the letter and said they are taking it in and they are going to supervise it, go through it, and possibly give a reply in due course. Uh, Medina, any movement from the OB camp? Some four or five days ago, the obedience team, led by Dr. Yunus Satanku, held a peaceful demonstration. That was just some few days after the election. They held a peaceful demonstration in Abuja. But subsequently, most of the protest marches are being held across the country in various states, pockets of protest marches that are being reported on social media and, of course, conventional television and radio stations. The latest one is that of the PDP that was held to date. These protests by the OB camp earlier and uh, uh, by Abu Bakr's uh, camp now, is this a lack of faith in the judicial system? Because already the court challenge is being heard, right? Yes. The appeal court has given the PDP and the Labour Party the permission to inspect the electoral materials for the presidential elections of February the 25th. But despite that, they are going about holding protest marches. This time, they are calling for total cancellation of the elections completely. Despite the fact that they are being given the go-ahead by the appeal court, which is second in command to the Supreme Court, to go and inspect the electoral materials that were used, it is a little bit of a surprise to all of us press people. Despite the fact that Atiku Abubakar told us at a press conference on Thursday that it is the right of Nigerian citizens to stage protest marches on anything that they are displeased about. So he encouraged this protest. He even joined the protest, which is to show that the Nigerian constitution is giving everybody the right, is giving everybody the freedom to voice out his or her own complaints during protest marches. It was a very, very peaceful demonstration. Nothing remarkable happened. There is nothing like shooting or tear gassing or anything. They went about it peacefully and they concluded it peacefully. And, and finally, uh, Medina, uh, Bola in Tubu, you know, the ruling party, which received 37% of the vote to win the election. What is that camp saying right now regarding the protests? What the AP camp led by uh, elected president Bola Tinumbu is saying is that all the opposition parties should forgive what happened, forgive the INEC, even if they are displeased about some few actions of the Independent Electoral Commission, and come to join hands with the APC-led government to carry Nigeria back to its lost gl- glory. That was Medina Dauda from VOA's House Service. She spoke with me from the Nigerian city of Abuja.
You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. UN members agreed over the weekend on a treaty to protect the biodiversity on the high seas. The Associated Press says the treaty will create a new body to manage conservation of ocean life. It will also establish protected areas for marine life outside national boundary waters, which represent over 40% of the Earth's surface. The treaty updates the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which came into force nearly 30 years ago but failed to adequately protect ocean biodiversity. Several marine species, including dolphins, whales, turtles and fish, migrate across the high seas and national borders. Environment establish ground rules for environmental impact assessments for commercial activities. And depending on how it is implemented, it could protect marine life from danger, including exploitation from commercial fishing, mining, and pollution for, from chemicals and plastics. A military court in Cameroon over the weekend charged a media mogul, a military officer and a police commissioner with complicity in the January torture and killing of journalist Martinez Zogo. Cameroon law state that crimes involving the use of weapons, especially guns, can be handled by a military court. Cameroon President Paul Bia also ordered the military court to carry out the investigation into Zogo's death, which led to media owner Jean-Pierre Amugu Belinga, a police boss and several officers, to be detained last month. Journalists in Cameroon are calling for justice, despite receiving threats since Zogo's killing and just days later the killing of a radio host who was also calling for justice. Moki Edwin Kinzeka reports from Yaounde, Cameroon. Cameroon media reported such a day that business tycoon and media mogul Jean-Pierre Amugu Belinga, Lieutenant Colonel Justin Danwe, and Police Commissioner Maxim Eko Eko are being held in a maximum security prison in pre-trial detention along with several policemen and civilians. A Yaoundé military tribunal charged the three men Saturday with complicity in the torture that led to the death of journalist Martinez Zogo in January. Zogo's mutilated remains were found five days after his abduction in the capital Yaoundé. Seven other suspects detained in a series of February raids, including one on Belinga's house, were released Saturday without charges. Richard Tanfu is a human rights lawyer and member of the Cameroon Bar Council. What to retain is the strong message that the Cameroon judiciary is sending to the national and international community that Cameroon is a state of law. Everyone can be held criminally responsible for his act. Even though they still benefit from the presumption of innocence, they are now henceforth known as defendants. And if after findings there are sufficient evidence, the charges may move from accomplice to maybe the perpetrators of torture on the journalists. But journalists in Cameroon say they feel like they are under attack. Just two weeks after Zogo's killing, the body of another journalist, Jean-Jacques Olabebe, was found in the capital. The radio host and Catholic priest had called for justice for Zogo and told journalists he was receiving death threats. Cameroon's government has yet to issue a statement on the death of Bebe. The Cameroon Journalist Trade Union says it has recorded scores of reporters saying they and their relatives have been threatened since the killings of Zogo and Bebe, and many suspect officials are involved. Royal FM reporter in Yaoundé, Mapala Zita, says she has received several hostile phone calls, the most recent one on Sunday. It's like we even end up being scared of executing our job the way it is supposed to be done. You're sending out the right information and then you're being, you know, threatened for it. Seriously, what we need is that the government should give us that liberty which we deserve so that we can practice in full freedom. Let us be free to carry out our job without any threat, without any fear of the unknown. Journalists say they have reported the threat to the police. The police have not said if investigations into the allegations have been opened or not, but told VOA that they will protect all journalists exercising their duties.
Cameroon's communication minister and government spokesman, René Emmanuel Sadi, last week warned journalists against what he described as emotional reporting on the Zogo and Bebe investigations. He said there was no deliberate attempt to withhold information, as reporters are claiming, adding that any communication while investigations are ongoing are by law to remain confidential. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Yawundi, Cameroon. VOA. VOA Africa is your trusted source for news, sports, entertainment and music. Stay engaged with VOA Africa. We love to hear your voice. You can call us 24-7 on WhatsApp and leave a message. Leave comments, requests or greetings. We may play your message on VOA Africa. Dial the international code plus one. Then 202-258-3076. VOA Africa is always happy to hear your voice. The number again is the international code plus one. Then 202-258-3076. Tunisian President Kai Saeed has denounced racism and suggested possible legal action against perpetrators who attack African migrants. His remarks comes 10 days after he said migrants who are part of a demogra- demographic plot to make Tunisia less Arab. Since then, hundreds of migrants have been detained, evicted, fired and attacked by youth gangs. According to the French news agency AFP, Saeed announced that Africans could stay up to six months without seeking residency instead of three and a year for students. He also said migrants who overstay could leave without penalty, and he said his crackdown on on them is part of a campaign against human trafficking. Saeed's remarks come as opposition to his rule grows. In the past two years, he has assumed nearly complete political power, which he says was needed to prevent chaos. On Sunday, hundreds protested in Tunis against his rule and called for release of detained opposition leaders, whom he calls traitors and terrorists. The government said the protest was illegal, though police said they would not use force to stop it. On Saturday, thousands from the UGTT Labour Union and rallied parties, allied parties, state one of the biggest protests against Saeed so far. The World Bank says solar mini-grids can help tackle sub-Saharan Africa's energy crisis by providing power to underserved villages and communities. Speaking at a week-long conference on renewable energy, a senior World Bank official urged African countries to support mini-grid operators in expanding their customer base in areas with no link to the national grid. From the Kenyan capital, Ruben Chama reports for VOA. In sub-Saharan Africa, about 600 million people still lack access to electricity. But experts say solar mini-grids can provide a lasting solution. Camille Noama is the World Bank Operations Manager for Kenya, Rwanda, Somalia and Uganda. We believe that mini-grids are poised to play a significant role in closing this energy gap. And we know this because new technologies such as remote monitoring, smart meters, have made it possible for countries and developers to deploy this at an unprecedented scale. Uh, Solar-powered mini-grids can be the least cost solution for providing affordable electricity to 380 million people in Africa by 2030. Some say solar mini-grids can provide high-quality uninterrupted electricity to nearly half a billion people in unpowered and underserved communities. Significant progress has been made in several African countries to expand use of mini-grids, as Noama explains. The deployment of solar mini-grids in sub-Saharan Africa has accelerated tremendously from about 500 in 2010 to over 3,000 installed today and already planned 9,000 additional grids. And they're also on track to 
provide this power at a low total cost of 20 cents per kilowatt hour and slowly bringing this down over time. This is lower than the true cost of power, actually, for many utilities across Africa. In Nigeria, for example, a market-driven approach to mini-grid development under the World Bank-supported National Electrification Project has sparked the deployment of more than 100 new solar-powered mini-grids. In several countries, such as Ethiopia and Zambia, new regulations and policy directives are making mini-grids more attractive for private sector investment. In Kenya, a combination of favorable policies and a robust business model based on public-private partnership is underpinning the World Bank-supported Kenya Off-Grid Solar Access Project, which is targeting almost 150 new mini-grids in areas with low electricity access rates. Davis Chirichir is Kenya's Cabinet Secretary for Energy and Petroleum. In sub-Saharan Africa, 568 million people still lack access to electricity today. This translates to 8 out of 10 people who live without electricity, making Africa the continent with the lowest access rate. In Kenya, however, we have great strides towards universal electrification. Our current connectivity stands at 75% of Kenyan households from a low of 23% or thereabout in 2013. The meeting brings together key mini-grid sector stakeholders from across Africa with a focus on accelerating deployment of the technology. Ruben Chama, VOA News, Nairobi. Witnesses in northern Burkina Faso say a group of terrorists killed 12 to 14 people last week. Residents of the Aorema village near the town of Uuguya told the French news agency AFP the attack took place at an informal restaurant where young people had gathered. The witnesses say seven died immediately and three died in their homes where they were hit by stray bullets. Others died from their wounds. Security sources confirm the attack and say operations are underway against the assailants. Authorities have imposed a 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew on the north and parts of the center-east region until the end of the month. More than 10,000 people have died since Islamic extremists swept in from neighboring Mali in 2015. And with that, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of our producer, Mokbilia Bar.